And if you have a high-tech tank, can you rely on the addition of the fish food to provide your plants with the nutrients they need to grow? That was always a question that I had, and that's what I wanted to address with this first experiment. We gotta bust out the lab coat for this one, guys. It's been a long time since we've had this thing on, but it's kind of appropriate for today's video. Hey, what's up, guys? Fish tank scientist Mike here. Today, we're finally gonna be talking about the experiment tanks that we set up like a million years ago. I think it was almost like six months ago, okay? I'm gonna try and make this video as concise as possible, but there's so many things we have to talk about, it's, I'm probably gonna be all over the place, okay? So bear with me, please. We're finally just now getting to talking about the first experiment, which wrapped up, I wanna say, a little over a month ago. We're pretty much done now with experiment number two, which we're not gonna talk about now. We're gonna be talking about the first experiment that we initially did a long time ago. There's multiple reasons for why we're just kind of gonna go over the first experiment and not really dive into it the way that I originally wanted to because a few things were really interesting that I think are still applicable even though the experiment didn't really work out. So before we talk about any of this, I want you guys to go and check out the original video where we set up these two tanks and there's a lot of information about what we did. So if you missed that video, go check it out. It'll be at the top of the description. And if you're watching this video a million years in the future, there might be a whole playlist linked there with a bunch of videos that you can check out. And I hope that that's the case. So anyway, these two aquariums are essentially the same. And the idea was to tweak one thing in one aquarium and then see the difference. Now there's a lot of reasons why these experiments are not very good experiments. One of the reasons is that there isn't always a control and every good experiment needs to have a control. Once upon a time, I used to be an actual scientist, uh, so I recognize the fact that these aren't very proper and that they're more of just a comparison between two things. And then we're doing a lot of qualitative analysis versus quantitative. We're not, you know, tweaking something and then harvesting the, the plants and drying them out and weighing the difference. It's very quantitative. We're using our eyes is, you know, do these plants look better than these plants? Did they grow more than these plants? Things like that. And then another really big limitation that we have is our access to uh, high resolution equipment. So when we do things like measure nutrient concentrations, we're using rudimentary stuff. We're, we're still using good equipment. We're using, you know, like API liquid test kits. That's just the best that we have. We're not able to detect minute changes in concentrations you know, because we don't have access to high grade, expensive lab equipment. Just because we're getting a zero on these test kits does not mean that there is zero in the tank. And likewise, when you're using a color metric test like this, we're using our eyes, which I mean, maybe I'm colorblind and I don't even know it. There's also an issue with there being like, hey, this is between 20 and 40 ppms. Well, which is it? Is it 20 or is it 38? We have no way of knowing. So we have to use a little bit of supplementary information like, hey, how much are we adding to the tank to kind of deduce what that concentration is more likely to be. We're just doing the best that we can here with the equipment that we have to interpret the results. These are two 16 gallon water box aquariums that are side by side, obviously, and they have the same plants in each one. They're mirrored, so their position relative to things like the filter and the CO2 are the, exactly the same. I've also tested as many of the parameters as possible, so pH, water hardness, um, and they all match up. They're all identical before, of course, we change something in one of them or the other. So pH, we're looking at being a right around six and a half before we do anything. Uh, water hardness is also pretty low. I'll put those numbers on screen. I can't remember what, it, what exactly they are on the top of my head. And then the lighting for the two tanks is the same. We had access to a PAR meter a while back, and I think we were getting something like 70 PAR at the bottom of the substrate, which is gonna classify these two tanks as high tech as far as a light perspective goes, as long as we have 50 PAR or more at the substrate than we're in a high light environment. They both have CO2, we're measuring the CO2 by the bubbles per second coming through, but then we're also double checking the pH shift as a result of the CO2 with these 
uh, liquid checkers that we have in the tanks right now. And you can see that they're different right now. Again, we're in a, a different experiment right now relative to the one that we're talking about. Another really huge limitation to any kind of plant growth study in an aquarium is that we can't have any way of quantifying the substrate's influence on the plant growth. Remember, we're using an active aquarium substrate, a common kind that a lot of people use. That's why we decided to use it. The composition of this substrate is fairly diverse. It has organic components, it has inorganic components, and it does have a lot of micronutrients in it. This particular kind doesn't have any added macronutrients to it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything that the plants could take advantage of. There's just no good way to quantify this influence, so just keep that in the back of your mind that a lot of these plants could be getting some nutrients from this substrate. This experiment to me ended up not really working out too well because I think we used the wrong fertilizer. We were using something that um, I didn't think the ratios were gonna be good for a high tech tank and I don't know, for whatever reason, I didn't put that together in my brain until we were like halfway through the experiment. So this is one that we definitely wanna redo. I wanna still go over it briefly and share with you some of the interesting observations that we made because they're gonna help make the second experiment make a little bit more sense. So question for the first experiment was, by adding fish food to our aquarium, are we supplying our plants with an adequate amount of nutrients? Fish food is a huge component. It's pretty much the only input to our aquarium on a regular basis that may or may not have a big impact on the environment. We add fish food to our aquarium. What are the byproducts? We have fish waste in the form of ammonia being excreted from the gills. Then we also have fish poop, which ends up at the bottom of the tank, which is chock full of pretty much everything else. But how much is coming out of the fish and is a result of adding the fish food? That's kind of the question. If you have a high-tech tank, can you rely on the addition of the fish food to provide your plants with the nutrients they need to grow? That was always a question that I had, and that's what I wanted to address with this first experiment. This experiment lasted for about 30 days. We started by chopping all the plants down once they had been established and I felt comfortable about starting the experiment. If we started out with plants that weren't really acclimated and ready to take advantage of whatever the treatment was, then I didn't think we were gonna have a very good experiment. So to start out on day zero, I chopped all the plants down to as close to the same point as I could. You wanna take note of like, some of the plants aren't identical in both of the scapes. There's roughly the same amount, but some of them just ended up not growing as well as the others. For example, the lobelia in the tank on the right ended up not being as strong or as good looking as the stuff in the tank on the left. The same goes for the needle leaf liguigia. It does look better in one of the tanks than it does in the other, despite the fact that they're all cut from like the same stems and the conditions in both the tanks are roughly the same. It's just an individual plant health thing. I mean, one pot of lobelia compared to another that looks like it has the same foliage isn't always gonna end up performing the same. They're two different plants. This tank got the ferts and then this tank got 10 neon tetras and 0.2 grams of fish food per day. This is like close to what I felt was an adequate pinch for 10 fish and we added that once to the tank every day. And here's another example of why this isn't a really a true experiment, guys, is because both of their tanks end up having a treatment with no control, okay? So it's more of just a comparison. Fish in this tank, no fertilizers. Fish food is the fertilizer. We have a tank here with no fish, but we're adding fertilizers to it. Both tanks have CO2, and they have the same light distribution. Some things that we wanted to measure in this experiment was the nitrate and the phosphate. Those are two kind of like hallmark compounds in the aquarium, right? Nitrate is gonna be the result of the ammonia passed from the gills to the water column to the filter, which gets converted into nitrate, which can have a hard time exiting the aquarium if we don't have plants. It's thought to be one of those compounds that our plants are going to consume. We also can test for it relatively easily with an API test kit. The other compound being phosphate, there's a really easy phosphate test kit. And on top of this, we typically think that overfeeding is gonna cause high phosphates. So that was kind of another question that we could address as well. So I just measured the nitrate and the phosphate concentration of both of these aquariums for a 30 day period. I added fertilizer to this tank to bring up the nitrogen concentration to, you know, whatever I, felt like there was no target. It was basically just like, hey, kind of EI dose this in your own way. I just wanted to be able to see the concentrations of uh, nitrate and phosphate in the tank. 
Now let's talk about what I was anticipating with this comparison, guys. So my initial thoughts were, hey, we're gonna be adding fish food to a tank that has fish with CO2, it's a high-tech tank. I thought that we were gonna see an increase in phosphate, and then that would become the problem nutrient that we would be primarily doing water changes for. I thought that if we have a tank with CO2 and high lighting, we're probably gonna have a decent amount of nitrogen consumption. I don't think we're gonna see any nitrate in the water column, but we might see phosphate as a result of feeding a decent amount of food to our fish. I also thought that by adding just fish food, not any fertilizers to this high-tech tank, the plants would not grow as much as the plants over here in the aquarium that was getting CO2, the same lighting, but then a bunch of fertilizers in the water column. And to my surprise, a few interesting things ended up happening during this 30-day experiment. The first really interesting thing was that both of the tanks seemed to have pretty close to the same growth rate. The tank on the left did have a little bit of an advantage as far as biomass, at least visually. Again, we can't check. We can't check the actual weight to make sure there is a difference, but visually, quantitatively, it looked as if the tank on the left that was getting the nutrients did have a little bit more growth to it. Both of the aquariums were also developing some green spot algae on the front panel of glass. And interestingly enough, this green spot algae is supposed to be a symptom of having really low phosphate in your water column. Turns out that both of these tanks had a low phosphate in them. The tank on the left was receiving phosphate from the fertilizer, but it just wasn't in a high enough ratio to stay in the aquarium for very long, at least detectable in the water column. What I think was actually the most interesting thing was that the aquarium that had fish that we were only adding fish food to every day, 0.2 grams, we were never able to detect nitrate or phosphate in the water column at any point. I was expecting to have to do a water change at some point because of the buildup of nitrogen or maybe even phosphate. I mean, phosphate isn't that dangerous to the fish. I don't think it really is at all, but I mean, certainly like algae wise, we don't want to have a ton of phosphate in here. So that was really interesting. I did not anticipate that. Over here on the tank that received the fertilizer, we went through a lot of periods where we had no detectable phosphate in the water column, but we had nitrogen. And that's in part because we weren't using a very applicable fertilizer. The ratios weren't quite where the, I think they need to be for a high tech tank at least. And so we went through periods where we could detect nitrogen, but no phosphate. During the first half of the experiment, the first 15 days, we had very little phosphate in the water column. And as a result, we also had a green spot algae on this tank as we did on this tank. Later in the experiment, the last 15 days, we started adding more phosphate to this tank, two PPMs, five PPMs, and at that point, we stopped seeing the green spot algae while we continued to see it over here in this tank that always had a phosphate limitation. So that was cool to see that the green spot algae on the glass at least seems to be a result of a very low phosphate concentration inside the tank. Another thing that happened was that we started to develop a little bit of a cloudiness to this tank and you can actually probably still see it right now and that was kind of a weird thing to notice. We never saw that happen over in this tank um, and it's still unclear to me what exactly the cause of that is. Cloudiness in the water can be a couple different things. You know, you'd think it would probably be like a bacterial bloom or something. I did take samples of both of these tanks and went and looked under my microscope, and I wasn't able to see any difference, at least, you know, as far as cells go. Uh, I also don't have the proper equipment to do any kind of gram staining or anything like I used to do back in the old days, but uh, nothing jumped out at me right away. Doesn't mean that that still couldn't be what's going on. We're just gonna have to wait and see. But I mean, what was really interesting was that the tank that didn't have any detectable nitrogen or phosphorus in the water column was still able to hang with the tank that had a replete amount of ferts most of the time. Again, just because we're detecting zero phosphate, zero nitrate in this tank doesn't mean that it's not there in smaller quantities. But still, I mean, 
when you think of like EI dosing and trying to keep a concentration of 20 to 30 parts per million nitrogen, uh, you know, three to eight ppms of phosphate or whatever it is, we're not even close to that. We're at, you know, undetectable and we're still seeing growth that matches that of a tank that has added ferts. Granted, the added ferts weren't at a proper ratio for a high tech tank. There's a lot of demand when you're adding CO2 for those nutrients. And so I think both of these tanks uh, didn't have everything that they could have. And certainly there was replete nitrate always in this tank. We never saw it go to zero, rarely. And interestingly enough, when the phosphate would go to zero and be undetectable in here, I would see the nitrate consumption slow down as well. So these are all things that we're gonna revisit when we do this experiment properly. We'll throw up graphs and we'll make a lot more sense of this, but I just wanted to kind of show the highlights from the first failed experiment, guys. Uh, CO2, no added nutrients, using just fish food was enough to get similar growth to a tank that, you know, it still didn't have replete nutrients, but didn't have fish food, didn't have any kind of input other than the fertilizer, and that was kind of interesting to me. I thought that we would see a lot less growth in this tank because I thought we would have to add nutrients in the form of fertilizer to get that growth. But I just wanted to share with you some of the information that, uh, you know, some of the observations that I made because I think that information is going to help make sense when we move into the second experiment, which is winding up right now. So anyway, guys, if you like this video, I hope it wasn't too much of a rambling mess. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, check out the playlist for the experiments if you want to kind of follow along. Maybe this is a year down the road and there's a couple more experiments in there. Don't forget to hit that like button if you like the science videos coming back, guys. These experiments are fun. I don't know, I'm having a good time. So anyway, uh, thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Fish Tank Scientist, Fish Mike out. <laughs>